Welcome, everyone. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Como esta, Pogayo? Thank you for joining us today on the first day of the 2022 Asian Evaluation Week. My name is Zakaria Hanafi, and I'm head of the Evaluation Learning and Outreach Section at the Independent Evaluation Department of the Islamic Development Bank. I'm delighted to be your moderator for this session titled The Role of Social Media Data in Post-Pandemic Context, a Tool for Transformative Evaluation. This falls under the sub-theme of innovating and retooling evaluation towards resilient recovery. Today, we have a very focused and highly informative session for you. Uh, this is the culmination of collaborative efforts from the ISDB Independent Evaluation Department, the ISDB Institute's Economic Research and Statistics Department, and CityBeats. Of course, I would be remiss not to thank our colleagues from the Asian Development Bank, Independent Evaluation Department for their meticulous organization and facilitation of this virtual session. Just a couple of reminders, you saw them in the um, intro uh, slides uh, before we get started. If you have any questions during the session, please type them into the Q&A mark chat box located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I will bring them up either during the interventions or we will address them during the Q&A segment before closing. Um, just allow me to, to give you a bit, uh, set the, script, the, the stage here. Our main focus from this session will be elucidating the role of data science as a whole and social data in particular in contributing to crisis response through products, partnerships, and processes. Panelists will pull from recent experiences responding to the COVID-19 pandemic with the ultimate goal to accelerate actions and impacts towards a sustainable recovery. The main lessons learned of global responses to the pandemic has been the importance of agility and responsiveness to member states on one hand, and on the other hand was the lack of data which exacerbated matters and slowed the effectiveness of those interventions. Ultimately, we will introduce innovative tools that can equip the evaluation practice with impactful solutions to better inform the decision-making process, as well as uh, identify or fill the knowledge gaps uh, for faster outbreak tracking and response, improved understanding of crisis behavior change, and accurate mapping of services needed. Uh, doing that by adopting user-centric solutions that offer compelling possibilities for providing access to services in sectors that are key for development, such as health, education, uh, agriculture, and financial services. We will address how data indexes can be used to improve public sector understanding of educational needs and knowledge gaps, allowing more targeted and timely initiatives to disseminate critical information in the health sector, which has been most affected by the pandemic. The analytics can be instrumental in understanding population health trends and containing outbreaks. It can improve continuity of care and more import importantly, use uh, and create massive data sets in which treatments and outcomes can be compared in an efficient and effective manner. So this could be applied also to vaccine hesitancy and rollout campaigns for other inoculations, such as measles and polio too. In agriculture sector, data observatories may help governments better predict food production trends and incentives. This knowledge can be used to ensure the availability of pro proper crop storage, reduce waste and spoilage, and provide better information about what types of interventions are needed and in remote areas. Also will help identify regions in distress so that targeted assistance can be directed to them. Early detection, this is one term that you will hear over and over today on the utility of, these, of the data analytics. It can help prevent families from leaving their land and further decreasing agricultural production leading to food insecurity. With that, I should put a break and excitedly ask you to allow me to introduce our distinguished panelists, starting with Dr. Arif Suleiman. He's the director of the Economic Research and Statistics Department at the Islamic Development Institute in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, where he heads the team providing thought leadership in all matters related to economic policy, socioeconomic research, statistics, and evidence-based analysis needed to support initiatives of the ISDB and its member countries. His versatile experience includes providing policy analysis on economic and industrial policy across Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. Uh, Dr. Arif holds prominent leadership roles in multiple boards, committees, and global task forces. He is currently serving on the Islami Bank Bangladesh, 
the board of directors of the United Bank of Albania, Islamic Bank Foundation, Islamic Bank Securities, and the Paris 21 Partnership. Prior to joining the ISDB, Dr. Arif served as the CEO of one of the most successful innovation funds in South Africa, managing the strategy, plan planning, and implementation thereof. Dr. Arif holds a PhD in economics, along with a master's of business leadership. Our second panelist is Mr. Dario Garcia de Viedma. He's a product manager at CityBeats. He, he and his dynamic team work on conceptualizing a technology that helps deci decision makers prevent the next crisis by analyzing open source data with natural language processing algorithms in an ethical manner. He leads the design of the social indicators, which he will address during his presentation, thanks to an alliance with Princeton and NYU scholars. There are metrics reported, uh, these are metrics reported on re in real time that measure deep feelings in society, such as civic unrest, polarization, perception of inflation, empowerment, and distrust. Prior to his current role, Mr. Garcia de Viedma worked as a social data analyst for CityBeats, being a trusted advisor for different institutions, such as the Inter-American Bank, the Organization of American States, and the United Nations Development Program. Mr. Garcia completed his bachelor's in social sciences and a master's of science in social research methods from London School of Economics. Now, without further ado, we will turn over to Dr. Arif Suleiman for his intervention. Dr. Arif, you have the floor, sir. Thank you, Zakaria. Much appreciated. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you are in the world. Uh, we were hoping that we would actually meet physically at some point and let's hope the next time around we do this physically now i've been asked to share my thoughts on using real data to inform decision making in a post-pandemic world and what i'm going to do this morning uh, and i'll stick to using this morning so that my brain doesn't confuse itself between the different time zones uh, is talk you through what what we're doing at the islamic development bank and the islamic development bank institute but also give you a sense for some of the key challenges that we're facing and hopefully Dario can come come in, in in the second phase of this and and provide a bit more insights in terms of some of the solutions and some of the more innovative and novel ways we we, we need to be doing business so over the past couple of years we've been hit by two unprecedented crises that have impacted on the way we think and the way we do business but also very importantly uh, forced us to start focusing more on getting high quality data in a very timely manner in order for decisions to be informed and for governments and decision makers to take evidence-based decision making and you can understand um, the challenges that we would have faced coming out of the COVID pandemic if we did not have real-time data on what was happening and where it was happening now data generally takes three different forms uh, Either you'd have structured data, which is nice, easily packaged, ready to use, semi-structured or unstructured data, which is all over the place. The bulk of the data today is, is unstructured. So about 80% plus of all data that, that is available is unstructured data, but 90 plus percent of everything that we do and everything that we use on our end of the world is on the structured data side. So I think you know, important to understand that there's different levels of data and from from institutional perspective or from an institutional perspective, the focus tends to be by and large working with structured data that is reliable, but the challenge with that is it is not necessarily as timely as one needs it to be. So just in terms of how we use the data and analyze this to have maximum impact, and I'm just talking you through a process that we would normally do, and irrespective of the source of data, uh, you know, the, we would follow a similar sort of process. So generally, we would use data to identify key issues, either global, national, regional, at whichever level, to try and understand what are the key development challenges. And I'm talking from a development banking perspective, uh, but you, you can use the same sort of analogy across across the board, right? So we would initially start with identifying key challenges based on data that is currently available. We would then mobilize different so, different resources, either financial, human, or collaborative data resource, you know, partners who have better quality data or more reliable or more timely data to pull all of that together. 
with a view to, to doing proper diagnostics and analyzing what those challenges are with a view to coming up with key solutions in order to have the maximum possible impact. And when we say impact, we want, we want to be able to better target our interventions, but ultimately impact on global well-being, on people's well-being, and also uh, you know, from, from a development perspective, the 2030 agenda, so the sustainable development goals also equally important. But as I mentioned in the first slide, by and large, a lot of what, what we do is based on structured data. It is based on, uh, to a very limited extent, semi-structured, but by and large, structured data is what, what we're using. The big gap in what we have is we're not taking into account all those conversations taking place online and all of those deliberations, all of that wealth of information, uh, data, information, knowledge that's, you know, all of those, that's coming out of all of those conversations, that's not being captured adequately. Now, what this does push us to, and, and, and the pandemic has been actually very critical in helping us globally understand the importance of actually having real-time data. Now, real-time data is not something we're unfamiliar with. Uh, this is something probably you all have seen multiple times before and may have consumed at different stages in your life. Now, what you have in front of you is pretty much a pie chart. Sorry, sorry, it's not a pie chart. That's a pizza. But a pizza, which is actually a real-time pie chart, letting us know exactly what percentage of that pizza is left over for us to enjoy. So... It's, you know, real-time data is not something that we are unfamiliar with. Now, what can real-time data do for us? Now, if you look at the pandemic itself or the other crises, the middle, the crisis in Eastern Europe or the recent crisis in, in Pakistan uh, arising out of climate change and the flooding thereof, the key questions that we are stuck with is how big is that impact? Who is impacted? Where is the impact? and what resources are required to tackle uh, the challenge and to address the development challenges and problems arising out of all of this. This is where real-time data can play a very important and useful role in helping us better identify what is required and where it is required and who is doing what uh, in, in the different areas. So this would also avoid duplication of effort and ensure that resources are utilized most efficiently and most effectively. Now, during the pandemic, what we had was a pretty good indication. And, you know, those that were following the, the levels of infections, et cetera, pretty much on a, you know, per second basis, you could pick up exactly how many people were being tested, how many were, uh, were positive, and then when the vaccines came out, how many were vaccinated. And this was pretty much in real time. On the those that travel a lot, uh, you know, you, you could track which countries were closed, which ones were opened, also flight patterns. And then also in terms of using technologies from, from NASA, Earth observation technologies, et cetera, we could also estimate and see exactly where economic activity is taking place and where it isn't. So during the pandemic, data actually came to the fore and policymakers realized the importance of high quality high velocity, timely data. So this pretty much is, is a huge, huge challenge that you know prior to the pandemic, uh, data, although it was seen as important, it was seen as a nice to have and not as something critical. As we've gone through that through the pandemic and, and come out of it, hopefully we, we, we're out of it, uh, the importance of high quality, timely data is, is very important. Now at the Islamic Development Bank, uh, given our development mandate, we've been focusing on, on high quality, timely data to support our member countries uh, in terms of their development interventions. Now, what I want to do is show a very short video clip on some joint work that we've done with the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data in Senegal, we're working with local partners in Senegal to help the country better understand certain key issues. And I don't want to talk too much about it. Let's, let's just watch the, the video clip.
Our member countries face the daunting challenges of poverty, hunger, lack of clean water, inadequate social services, and bearing the consequences of climate change. To help improve lives, we need to go beyond merely financing. In Senegal, the ISDB Institute partnered with the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, Senegal's Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development, and Initiative Perspective Agricole at Rural. Harnessing the latest technologies from NASA and Amazon Web Services, we have brought innovative solutions to collect timely and reliable data on the Sustainable Development Goals. Using Earth observation and non-traditional data sources, Senegal is now empowered to accurately measure progress on select SDGs. Harnessing the right data for the right problem helped address agricultural productivity, deforestation, and water resource management. Decision making was reduced from months to days and assessments from days to a few hours. This evidence-based approach to policy making helped address key challenges and build the government's long-term resilience to climate change. Okay, I think a couple of quick takeaways from that video is on the speed of decision making. Uh, so what used to take the country a few months to, to decide on, those decisions were now being are now being taken within a matter of a couple of weeks. And what used to take weeks is now down to a couple of hours. So clearly the pace of decision making, the quality of decision making uh, has improved significantly. Now, this is just some a, a specific example where we've piloted uh, trying to better understand the environmental uh, issues, environmental challenges using earth observation to better understand some of these key changes taking place in the country. Given the success that we've had in Senegal, there's been a lot of demand from other member countries to roll this out further. And we're looking at a few other countries at the moment to look at how best to use innovative data sources, uh, earth observation, etc., to be able to help countries take more informed and better quality decision making. Now, all of this is to a large extent still in the structured, semi-structured space. There's a big gap, which I'm sure Dario will talk, talk about, uh, in terms of online, those online conversations. So during the pandemic, social media has been a very vital source of information and data, but all of this is unstructured and the data is coming from all over the place. And you know this better than I do. Uh, in terms of Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, etc. So a lot of online conversations happening, a lot of online data taking place or, or being generated. And also during the pandemic, you had things like Google Trends or Facebook Safety Check, which gave a lot of additional insights into what's happening and where it is happening. Now, one of the key challenges that we face with this sort of data is the variety of data. So all, all of this best packaged into four Vs. And if you're still thinking about the pizza for those that are waiting for dinner, my apologies, uh, this one, you know, this is nowhere near, near the pizza, but pretty much a pie chart again, showing uh, the different areas that one would look at in terms of big data. So the variety of data coming out of there is phenomenal. The, the volume of that unbelievable, the speed at which this is being generated is just, out of this world. So it's a lot of data coming very quickly and all over the place. What the challenges are for institutions like ourselves and for data scientists is to be able to sift through all of that and extract what we see as value. Also, what is the valuable data coming out of that? And what is just, you know, so separate the wheat from the shop. So, so try and figure out exactly what is the intrinsic value of the different data itself. The last V, which is where we struggle extensively, is on fact-checking and ensuring the quality of that data, the veracity of that data, is at a level where we have a high degree of confidence. So how do we harness all of this in a way which gives us comfort that the data is of value and, most important, is accurate and is of a nature where we can base decisions on. So, so this is this is the big challenge. Zakaria, I don't have the answer for this, and I'm hoping Dario can give us a lot more insight into this, uh, in in terms of how they how they validate some of this stuff, so that over time we can start using uh, this unstructured and these online conversations, the social media data that's being generated, 
in a way to help us take better and, and more informed decisions. So in terms of the ISDB and a little bit of sales pitch in terms of how we're doing uh, what we do and the work that we are actually doing. So importantly, in from, from our perspective is we look for data that is response, uh, relevant, responsive, and reliable. And we use that to provide the evidence basis to support decision making in terms of where the bank's interventions are, but also to support our member countries take better quality decisions like we've seen uh, in, in the video on Senegal. In terms of the ISDB Institute itself, we've been focusing on developing key indices to act as an early warning signal for the bank in terms of key challenges. And this could be uh, levels of integration in terms of member countries, or we could be looking at uh, countries' vulnerabilities, their debt sustainability, et cetera. So these are the areas that, that we would look at. And then now with the emerging food crisis, we're monitoring uh, the you know commodity prices on a daily basis, but also using the commodities future market to monitor real-time expectations on global food production. Now, in terms of the data that we use, just to give you an, an indication of, of what we have currently, over two and a half thousand indicators from 60 different data sources. We have four online internal dashboards and this is one twenty two and a half million and counting, right? So this number changes on a daily basis, but pretty much for an from the institutional perspective, we, we, we tracking 2,500 indicators and, and using multiple online data sources, but these are all, you know, 99.9% .9 structured and semi-structured data, very little, if any, of the unstructured data being used uh, at, at the moment. So a very quick recap on, on, on my end, real-time data critical to supplement uh, and, and important to supplement traditional statistics, largely given what we've seen coming out of the crisis, this has become more and more important. We're starting to use a bit more innovative data sources, because we know that this contributes to better quality of decision making, especially if you can summarize and, and, and extract the core out of what that is and make sure that you, know, you, you convert this into something which is relevant and reliable. Very important as we move forward is collaboration between not just the multilaterals, but between multilaterals and other development partners and other data, data uh, partners to ensure that these new methods, these new tools and technologies are appropriate, but also that gives us confidence in terms of the quality and of, of the data that we're using. Zakaria, I want to stop there and thank, thank the Asian Development Bank and colleagues for all, all their hard work in pulling this together and thank the participants as well. Thank you, Zakaria. Back to you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Dr. Ari, for that insightful presentation. Um, it is very ripe with lessons learned and practical examples of successful initiatives worthy of replication in other member states. Uh, if you're just joining now, uh, and if you're not familiar with the Islamic Development Bank, uh, the, the Islamic Development Bank has over has 57 member countries and operates in four continents, uh, Africa and Asia, but also Europe and Central America. Um, I will try in a way to summarize what uh, some of the main highlights that Dr. Arif addressed. Uh, basically that large sets of data are created every day by the interactions of billions of people using various devices, computers, GPS devices, mobile phones, medical devices. Many of these interactions occur through the use of mobile devices being used by people in the developing world. Uh, this data can be, has a lot of potential and we would see in the next presentation how uh, it could be uh, uh, harnessed. Uh, so with that, uh, it's, it, this is the perfect narr narrative to introduce the next presentation by Dario Garcia. In it, we examine how ethical uh, AI forms of the uh, uh, indispensable pandemic response for helping organizations and communities reduce the risk of failure and innovate with confidence. We will learn more about the analytics solutions and methods that support advantageous reactivity amid the unprecedented change brought about by the pandemic. Dario, we are all ears. The floor is yours, hermano. Thank you, Zakaria. And thanks to everyone for being here. And thanks to the Islamic Development Bank Institute for inviting us here. We're very glad to be surrounded by 
evaluation professionals. I think that I have a lot in common with you for the evaluation professionals that I've met in my work, and some of you are, are here in the audience. Something we have in common is that we are very ambitious and that we have the ambition to change the world. So I'm so that's why I'm glad to work with you. And I believe that stories change the world. So I will start with a story, a personal one. In 2018, I was working in London for the council and as an interviewer for East Londoners, which those of you who know the city, it's a very diverse uh, population with uh, a lot of uh, Southeast Asian communities who are very well settled and I really admire their way of organizing and campaigning. So I was working as a community organizer, trying to bring together uh, Bangladeshi communities with Brazilian communities on common topics. And this helped me talk to many people. And imagine me in the middle of the rain in London or in the pub or in the mosque with my iPad and talking to people. And when every time I talked to a Londoner, they would grab my hand and tell me everything about their life. Like my daughter in school, my mom in, in the hospital, my business. And I was like, I just asked you about the park. Do you like the park or not? And so this, this is a story that shows how people need to be listened. And it was the first time ever that someone asked the, the, them their opinion about politics or about social life. So this is what pushed me to go work on City Beats. And three years after joining City Beats, we have had lots of success. We have been chosen as tech pioneers by the World Economic Forum. Um, recently, we won uh, Tech for Democracy Europe, being selected as the best GovTech company or startup in Europe, and we will be competing in the in the final next year. We have great clients, as well as a deployment in 75 countries, including many of the countries that you work in. And we would we are also ready in terms of algorithms to to include all the other countries. So what do we do? At CityBits, we are helping decision makers prevent the next crisis thanks to crowd intelligence. Just like Dr. Arif just said, uh, we have generated more than 90% of all online data in the past few years. And more than 80% of this data is unstructured. Like he said, this means that it's impossible for the human eye to read and that we need technology to help us interpret this data, which is why we have built our technology. How does it work? First, we collect in an ethical way all open source uh, data from social media, the social media you already know, like Instagram, uh, Twitter, Facebook, public pages, YouTube, Reddit, and then websites, forums, blogs, news, as well as um, surveys on people's phones. So we believe that not everyone is on social media. So we are also sending surveys to people's phones and they just reply and they get paid for replying in real time. This data is processed by our natural language processing and machine learning algorithm that will identify all the trends and anonymize it in an ethical way. And finally, our clients and license owners will have access to a dashboard in which they will see the insights that matter to them and that helps them make decisions in real time. This is how it looks like more or less. Some of the use cases that we are very proud to announce, for example, we are helping the WHO identify anti-vaccine narratives almost everywhere in the world, basically, and helping hospitals and, and um, public health institutions uh, tackle these narratives. We have also developed um, monitor for health emergencies. So as soon as there is an emergence of uh, fever in one community or skin uh, conditions or any other symptoms, we will be able to see it. And our mission is to not repeat the COVID-19 pandemic again, so that we are ready to identify um, these outbreaks in communities' health as soon as possible. We are also helping sustainable investment by identifying what communities attach social and environmental value to, so that our clients can bring the economic value as well, therefore having the three pillars of sustainability. So based on my experience working with people like you, evaluation professionals, I see two challenges that I would like to share about and to start the conversation about. First, how to balance immediate needs with long-term well-being of our communities. Secondly, how to balance hard data with soft data. I'll start with the first issue. I recommend that we try to kill two birds with, uh, two, yeah, two birds with one stone. So by identifying the ways, the ways in which we can solve immediate needs at the same time as building better futures. 
So for example, in Chile, we have, and in many other countries, we measure day on a daily basis what people say about employment, the needs in terms of food security, what education community is saying, um, as well as the state of health. So every hospital, what they are reporting, if they, if they have the material they need or not, et cetera. But these are material topics. And based on material topics, in 2019, we wouldn't have been able to predict the social unrest um, movements that started that, and that still open. They're still working on their constitution, right? So if we looked at this data, we would see that just before the protests, uh, the opinions about transportation increased a lot because people, it was like the last policy that really got people angry is that the ticket metro got more expensive. But it would be simplistic to believe that this measure uh, was the only cause of the unrest. It was a buildup. So that's why we developed the social indicators that Zakaria just mentioned. So we are monitoring on a daily basis deeper um, feelings that people have, such as distrust towards the government, towards vaccines, towards each other even. That's something that unfortunately exists. Civic unrest, which is how people feel treasoned and sometimes attacked by others. We also measure polarization, which is like the fronts and the battles that exist on social media. And actually people believe that social media is super polarized. Actually, it's not. Actually, it's built to show the polarization. When you go on your feed, you just see like the attacks and the fights, but there is a consensus over most topics. It's just designed to show the polarized topics. So with these two, we are seeing what topics are polarizing people and helping uh, our clients build policies that do not contribute towards polarizing society. We also measure perception of inflation. How does this work? We know that there are metrics that measure inflation that are reported every month, but we want to, to know this before every month reports. So it's not about the real inflation or price of things, it's how people perceive it. And which is, I believe is more important uh, towards guiding habits of consumption or saving. If people are scared that the prices will rise for certain products, that's what's going to drive them to take different economic habits rather than the actual price of things. And finally, we also measure empowerment, which is a metric that sees how likely people are to go to the streets and protest for something. So there, there are topics that empower people more and others than, that empower them less. So this is basically what we do. We combine um, long-term indicators, things that grow very slowly, but that add up and other things like more material elements that I showed before that fluctuate very quickly. Like today, everyone is talking about energy. Tomorrow, we don't know what people will be talking about. Or maybe we have trends to indicate that, but basically they, they change very quickly. So using this combination, I recommend, and I'm here to speak very honestly about how to help Pakistani communities in these moments of um, catastrophic flooding. We are already working with different Pakistani stakeholders to help them short term. First, identify the humanitarian needs. So here a bridge fell, here a uh, building uh, is not working. This public service is failing. Here in this community, so many people died or they, lack, they are lacking food. So real, really they're using our monitor to address very serious humanitarian needs. But they will keep working with our monitor whenever like this situation improves to build the country, to go back to building infrastructure and services that are resilient to climate change. Because we've seen, and I really admire Pakistani communities because they've shown great resilience from even before this flooding because they they know their their land better than anyone and they know how to build infrastructure and economic systems that are resilient to, to climate change. So I would like to empower all of you who, who work with Pakistani economy or who are Pakistani um, to, to look at how people are already being resilient and scale it up so that it, it, your policy is actually sustainable from a social and environmental perspective. So please write to me if you work in Pakistan. My second point is how to combine hard data and soft data. And I believe that this will help your research uh, with one, anticipation, and two, representativity. Let me use one example for each. 
I will start with anticipation. We are known for being good at predicting food security. Actually, for, for many countries, we've predicted it 60 days in advance um, before like other metrics showed up. But I think it needs to be a joint effort, not only with our data, which is more like soft data because it's more based on narratives and what people believe compared to hard data, which would be like radars or sensors that detect things um, more strictly. So um, for example, for food security, we can measure food availability by, by knowing the crops and by knowing the weather and by knowing the prices of commodities and futures, like uh, Dr. Arif just said. So this could be like hard data, but we also need to see how people react to it. Because when we see empty shelves, it, sometimes it's not because there's no food, it's because people are scared and they buy everything in bulk and keep it at home. So we need to see how people are being scared of food insecurity. Also how families are ready to change their diet because it's something that we'll have to do, change our diets. So how likely people are to do this. And we also can see resilience um, strategies. In many countries, uh, families, especially women, they are not able to buy the food on their own. So, so they're coming together with their community and they're cooking in the street and sharing the whatever the rice or the stew, whatever they're cooking with their community. And this is the, the only way for them to afford food. So we can see every community in which this is happening. And we can also see where it's not happening and empower and maybe help organizations uh, run these uh, community pods in different communities, right? Secondly, like I said, this will increase representativity. Like uh, Abby Senior, our CTO always says, Bias is not about the data you have, it's about the data you don't. So we learned this, for example, in one project in, in the Philippines, when uh, different stakeholders were seeing the trajectories to help mobility. So they were seeing, okay, most people work in point A and they live in point B. Therefore, le let's increase connections between A and B. Let's invest here. And we saw that you cannot only focus on the data that already exists. We need to see on where people are not traveling to because they can't. So we need to measure people's ambitions, people's frustrations, and seeing like data uh, work like with surveys and with uh, social media data, we saw that some people were, I wish I could have a better job, but better jobs are in this other part of town and it's impossible for me to travel there. Or I wish I could see my boyfriend more often but my boyfriend lives in another city and it's very expensive for me to travel there. So seeing all these ambitions and frustrations is also helping um, stakeholders in the Philippines build roads that connect people and projects that were not connected before. So this is um, the point that I wanted to share. And you might, you might be wondering what's next with this technology. You've seen that we have already a consolidated product that's being used by evaluation professionals across the world, and that's already helping them make decisions. However, we want to go farther and we want you to come with us. Like an African proverb says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So that's why a few months ago, we announced that we are going open source. So we are taking our algorithm and making it public so that data scientists and citizens from everywhere in the world can participate and can make our algorithms more diverse, more inclusive, more transparent. Imagine having different like uh, Urdu speakers, for example, who are improving our algorithm and making it understand Urdu from their community and uh, based on other data sources that we didn't think of that are in which people are from there are sharing their content. So this is how it's, we're going to scale our product. And this is an invitation. If any of you wants to join to make our platform better, let me know and you'll be able to, to join the waiting list for our open uh, ethical AI platform. So this is what I wanted to share. Please um, give me your thoughts, your feedback. Think about what decisions you've been taking and you would like to get citizen feedback from. So how we would affect communities or what pains of people uh, it would be solving. And I'm happy to talk about it. Thank you very much, Dario, for, for that um, highly informative and enlightening presentation. I think you have 
uh, both you and Dr. Arif have triggered the, the curiosity of many of our audiences. And um, I'm seeing uh, several questions being posted through, uh, but allow me first to give a bit of a, uh, a review of what you have just addressed, and then we will go and start addressing the questions. So the observatory indexes and platforms or monitoring platforms of CityBeats through the use of their AI analyze social big data, seek to better understand the needs in real time and to reflect the dignity, trust, security, and visibility of people. In the current context of the post pandemic, which has unleashed the global health and economic crisis, listening to and better understanding the public has invaluable value for the decision-making process of governments, development agencies, and NGOs, private sector, and overall communities. Indeed, um, development practitioners and policymakers are beginning to realize the potential for channeling these torrents of data into actionable information that can be used to identify needs, provide services, and even predict or prevent crises, which is the point that Dario mentioned about um, the food security crisis being uh, detected with, uh, early. Uh, and also for private sector agencies to ensure that this data helps the individual and communities who create it. Now, when Dario concluded about the ethical aspect of this data, you, City Beats, and please here correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Dario, uh, uses uh, publicly available information. There are no breaches of security, there are no breaches of privacy. So those issues are still being addressed by governments and regulatory bodies. However, what CityBeats does is access these blogs, these opinions, um, and processes them through their algorithm, mining the data and analyzing what the trends are, what could be the way forward and how to detect and prevent a crisis before it's happening. Uh, you heard about the detection of two months ahead. We know from the pandemic and in our MDB's responses to, to, to COVID, uh, two months is, is, is a lot of time. It's, it's really a lead time that allows you to prepare the response, address it, put it in place, ensure the procurement measures are there and, and, and be able to respond effectively and promptly to the member states and the communities in need. Um, so by leveraging these tools and gaining data-driven inferences, analysts are effectively managing the pandemic response and giving more people better ways to improve their path to the new normal. Uh, overall, artificial intelligence and data science are proving increasingly impactful and indispensable. So with that, let me pick some of the few questions that came through. Um, uh, we are getting a question from Veronique. Salz-Lozak, she says, but this is perhaps uh, addressed to Dr. Arif. Could you please give us some example of how you interact with the rest of the ISDB to inform and influence their actions? Okay, a couple of quick ones. So I've responded to that in, in the text itself, but to give you a practical example, uh, in terms of the work that we do, we produce things called country fact sheets, which give the bank uh, on a weekly basis, uh, this is an internal document that, that I speak of, but would give you give the colleagues in the bank an early warning system of which countries are facing, uh, you know, threats in terms of macroeconomic vulnerabilities, but also in terms of portfolio performance. All of this is is being tracked, so that helps the bank take better decisions and interact with the countries before something goes wrong. In terms of the crises. Uh, both the you know for the, at, during the pandemic and also now post post pandemic with with the current East European crisis, understand exactly which countries may be more affected or more severely affected, and which countries have or don't have the financial headroom to respond to these crises. So it's to give the institution a better understanding of where it needs to be focusing its efforts but also which countries may be coming to it in, you know, in the near term looking for support. So guiding those interventions, providing those early warning systems, this is the sort of uh, in interactions that we've had. Uh, and in terms of designing some of the larger initiatives of the bank, uh, you know, the evidence basis, the data, the quality of analytics will allow the bank to, to develop better quality interventions and better targets. So if you remember that slide I, I showed up front, towards the end of, of that uh, uh, timeline or, or that uh, spectrum, the, the impact of interventions is based, the quality of the impact of the interventions is based on the quality of analysis and the quality of data that you have. 
And think about the pandemic. If we didn't have high quality data, we would not be able to target a, lo a lot of the interventions globally. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, response. Uh, perhaps a question to Dario. Um, society reacts to lagging indicators instead of leading indicators. Why is it so? And also, uh, from your experience in the post-pandemic, you, you must have noticed a greater surge in demand on, for real-time data uh, and research and, and data analytics. Uh, could you give us examples of what you have seen as the, um, the trend uh, in, in the post-pandemic from your perspective, of course? Of course. So for the first question, lagging indicators versus leading indicators, I'm afraid to say I don't have an answer. I would like to know as well um, why people are focus, focusing more on lagging indicators, but I, I'm sorry I don't have an answer. And regarding post-pandemic trends, um, for sure, um, the pandemic is totally the past. I know that many people are still, are still struggling from um, COVID-19, but uh, public opinion is not showing so. Not a, many not many people are talking about it so what we are seeing now is an increase in conversations about the economy based on the uh, the current inflation uh, situation so people are going towards very individualistic conversations so how i'm going to save money myself or how i'm going to get ready to to for a worse situation or whether i'm going to lose my job and we are seeing a decrease in collective action and community conversations, which is something that worries me a lot. So this is kind of a major trend that we're seeing. And then for every topic, we see different different trends. Like, for example, education in many places in the North Hemisphere, kids are going back to school this week. So um, data education is increasing a lot. And uh, yeah, many other topics that we're monitoring. Thank you, Dario. Maybe one of the questions that also came through the through the chat, which is about the veracity of how true the information or how do you uh, make sure that the data is, is reliable? So how do you overcome uh, an excessive amount of information about a problem that is typically unreliable, spreads rapidly and makes a solution more difficult to achieve? And I, I have a quote from, from uh, the director general of the WHO, where he says at the beginning of the pandemic, that we are not just fighting an epidemic, we're fighting an infodemic. So how does CityBeats address some of these um, uh, challenges through its algorithm when processing the data that comes through? Um, of course, that's that's a problem. Having some Sometimes having so much data can become a problem. So that's why we've built a dashboard that even if you have 10 million opinions supporting something, you will, you will see what what's behind and what data is behind so that you can make your decision based on on the real data so we have a very strict methodology in which, which yes we collect everything that's been collected but then we we have filters like filters for noise for bots for data that you don't want and then we let data structure itself so we have cluster analysis that tell us uh, okay so this all these texts Obviously, we don't do it manually because we would, you are, we are not able to do so. So our AI knows that this whole bunch of text is about food security. This other whole bunch of text is about education, and there is some texts that are in common, etc. So it's not we try to apply the the less few, uh, human bias possible because we believe that fixing bias is adding even more bias. So our approach on this is to just be transparent and to um, show what we have and how our data is structured. Regarding the infodemic, um, I totally agree with that. And we are working with the WHO. They are one of our clients. And we have built a very interesting uh, monitor that is called EARS. And you can, you can go check it online, in, in which we're monitoring major food security, um, no, sorry, not, not food security, uh, infodemic trends uh, based on COVID-19, and now we have monkeypox, which is also bringing lots of issues as well, um, even more than the actual disease. So um, we're tracking that. Thanks, Dario. Perhaps a question to Dr. Arif about um, uh, building on the same narrative that you have seen a surge in demand for the real-time data uh, in your day-to-day -day, uh, operations. Did you enter into, into any partnerships with other development partners uh, in the during or post-pandemic? 
uh, you mentioned in your presentation the global data partnership and, and uh, were there others with UN system agencies, for instance, or other uh, partnerships that you've entered to kind of leverage uh, uh, the resources and be able to address the needs of member countries? This is a good, good question, right? We've got to be very selective in, in what we do, given that, you know, <clears throat> we data consumers and not really data producers as, as, as an institution. Uh, so the partnership with, with GPSTD or the global partnership is, is one of the uh, novel ones that, that we've done is focusing specifically on generating better quality and new data, but this is not our core focus area. Uh, we work with the Asian Development Bank also in terms of generating, and I don't want to get technical here, but on the economic side, uh, working through some of the supply use tables, input output tables to better understand linkages in the economy. But in terms of real data, real time data, it is only the partnership with, with the GPSDD. And maybe just to, to tag on to, to the issue mm -hmm. of the infodemic, <clears throat> it's it's not our core business again, right? So we would rely um, on on the expertise of teams like like the ones from City Beats, et cetera. And once once the data gets to a level where there would be a lot more uh, con confidence in, in the quality of the data, a lot more acceptability, because remember what when we use the data from, from an institutional perspective, you need to be able to defend this with your member countries as well. So they need to also have confidence in, in the decisions that you, do, you are taking and the quality of the data that you are using. This is not our core specialization as an institution or even as a statistics team. So we would, <clears throat> we would be looking to the experts uh, and, and once we reach a level of confidence where we are okay, we will move forward. So like on, on something like earth observation data and using that to inform decision-making to get a better understanding of, of, of what's happening on the ground. Uh, we're now at the level where we're comfortable with what's coming out and we can use this to work with governments and to inform decision-making. Thank you, that's an excellent uh, point. In terms of, you know, we have, uh, in terms of constrained government resources and MDBs also, and reduced foreign aid, uh, the insights produced by mining data or smarter data collection and analysis could free resources for use in economic development efforts. Do you foresee this as a trend coming forward as uh, you know, data analytics taking a greater role in the decision-making? Um, I have a question here from uh, Brother Adamo saying, how cost-effective is the use of large real-time data moving forward? Um, tough question, right? Because for sure, the, the pandemics forced us to start using more real-time data. The pandemics forced us to, to think differently about data. So historically, um, and just go back to basics when you know you would collect CPI data or inflation data, uh, literally you'd, you'd get guys going into the stores and taking prices. Uh, that, that then switched to uh, using barcode scanner data, then web scraping, and now a lot more AI, et cetera, coming in, uh, in terms of understanding some of these uh, these different indicators. Now, we've we've been very selective again in, in what sort of big data we're using. And our focus has by and large, as I mentioned in the presentation, been, being on using the structured data. Uh, someone like Dario and his team would be grabbing all of this unstructured data and trying to make sense of it. And once they reach the level of, and Dario, you, you know the trends on this better than I would, but, but once there's enough uh, you know, out there and it's been mainstreamed that the quality of data is better, the AI is working better because it's impossible to do this uh, manually, right? It has to be done using AI. Once all of this has, has developed to the stage where we are comfortable, then we would start using something like that. But for sure, uh, that, you know, that, that's something which has grown exponentially and will continue to do so. Dario, I don't know if you want to add, add to that. This is your space. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, yeah, I have exactly the, the approach from the opposite side of the spectrum. So, yeah, I also see it's growing and I and I see from, from the deals we keep closing that it's becoming it's becoming co uh, cost efficient, but it's also becoming um, like necessary. Like you just had, I wrote it down because I think it's a very good quote. Uh, it's not before it was a nice to have. Now it's a must have. So um, you need to see how the methodology you choose and the partners you bring with you. But it's definitely something that 
all development banks and multilateral institutions are adding to their decision making processes. Um, we have another question from Trent Dao. He's asking uh, how many times the re real time data need to be collected in one crisis or partic particular, let's say, an outbreak or natural disaster. Perhaps a question to, to, to Dario, for example, in the observatory indexes that you are setting up in Latin America, could be an example maybe to answer the question and also give what is the time scope when you do actually assess uh, response or, or detect or when you set in an observatory uh, index. Um, so my suggestion is to, to collect data live. So to see what's happening today and tomorrow and yesterday. But it's obviously important to do some benchmarking with past data. So it depends. If you think it's a um, more recent trend, I always like to compare it with the two months before. So to see how that's been growing. But if you consider to consider it a more structural trend, I, I'd rather compare it with one or two years. So that's how we we calculate trends. In terms of um, how much data to collect, um, our dashboard will not give you an insight if it's based on less than, I'm not sure because this was chosen by the data science team in which I'm do, to which I don't belong, but I think it's like around 1000 uh, opinions. If it's less than that for a region or a country, it will not be shown as an insight. You will just see like no data. So this allows you to only make decisions based on a significant amount of data. However, most of our insights have like six figures of numbers, obviously, because just for housing in Brazil, um, last week we had 10,000 opinions, you know? So um, we, we're not missing data. It's like, we have a lot of it and um, that's why we have minimums, but we almost never reach, reach them. Okay. Well, one other so question. Maybe if I could also come, come, come in on that one. Um, please, please. There's no single answer, right? So during the pandemic, it was pretty much every millisecond uh, we were collecting data on on number of uh, you know infections or once the vaccines were rolled out, how many vaccines were, were were delivered. So it depends on on the nature of the data. So with the work that we're doing on. Uh, environmental statistics and environmental degradation. Again, this could happen on a daily or weekly basis, depending on, on the nature of the indicator and what exactly you're looking at. So there is no single single answer on how often you should collect this, but real-time data is pretty much real-time. Thank you, thank you. One question from Warif Karashuli. Uh, he's asking, uh, we addressed a bit of his previous question, but how is the collected data verified? Perhaps uh, Dario, you could address that. Um, especially since we mentioned the ethical aspect that CityBeats observes, uh, how uh, in, in, you do not enter into, you mentioned the controversy, you are not taking a partisan side, you are not you know, uh, making uh, cases worse in terms of, let's say, uh, violence, or for example, the issue of mental health, which is something that you have assessed in your civil ethics uh, monitor. Uh, how does how how do you verify the data? Because you are now the, the new trend, or you are the the way forward in dealing with the unstructured data. How do you verify it without without divulging any trade secrets that <laughs> that you yeah. don't want to? Of course. So we make sure that the comments are real comments because we because we get it from our data suppliers, and then we ver we verify that it's like a unique user that's uh, posting this and sharing this information. However, we do not share, or like we do not check if the data is true because we, like you just said, we are not taking a partisan side. And we always say that we are not so ambitious to say what's true and what's not true. So we provide the narratives to our customers and they will see. For example, we are detecting a community in certain countries saying that the Pfizer, Pfizer vaccine is making people grow horns, for example. So we, we don't believe that, but we are saying this because it's what people are saying, right? So then the public health practitioners will say this is true or not true, and then we'll react to it. But we we, we know that we don't have the truth, so we're just showing to you what people say. Thank you. One question, perhaps the Dr. Arif also, it's from Mike Tiza saying, how much of the 2,500 indicators is actually being used by SDB? Are these tied to a specific strategy? Does that value somehow 
uh, diminished with these huge sets of indicators and how are they reported? So perhaps how many are used? I, I, I responded to that in the chat, probably between five and 10%, Sorry. to be honest, right? So, um, but, but that's, that's stuff that people are using all the time. So between five and 10%, different parts of the bank would be using this all the time. There'd be very specific indicators that very specific teams are looking for. And they would they would tap into those maybe once once a month or depending on, on on the work that they're doing. The challenge that one faces and and the reason you need to have these two thousand five hundred indicators, if and and let's let's take a conservative approach. Let's say five hundred of these indicators or seven hundred and fifty of these indicators are things that the teams are using every now and then. Uh, there's 150 to 200 that people are using more regularly. So there's another one and a half thousand ballpark that that are there just in case, right? The challenge is when someone needs a bit of information or some specific data, uh, he needs it at that point in time. You don't have the luxury of saying, okay, now let's go and find the right source for that data. Let us go and validate all of this. Let us package this in a way which makes sense. So many of these things are, are data points that we know may be called on. So they're relevant to the business and it's cost effective for us to extract and have those on hand uh, while we're working on the other data sets. Wonderful, thank you. Um, perhaps one question about climate change. Uh, is, is this a, a theme or a topic that City Beats address? We have a question saying, uh, what kind of data collection methods are being applied to climate change? So yeah, I think you mentioned the geospatial data and observations of food crops, and perhaps that, that could be along the lines of that. Um, yeah, that's a very good question and obviously a very necessary one as well. So we have developed uh, what we call sustainability monitor, which is helping um, institutions and companies identify trends in uh, sustainability. So um, as soon as society is ready or is getting ready for change regarding something, that could be mobility, packaging, different consumption. So this allows you to see when society is ready to do a change and that uh, so that the public and private sector can, can help them and guide them through it. So this sustainability monitor is helping our clients be the first to see the trends in order to react to them and, and build more sustainability, sustainable solutions. Outstanding, okay. So, so maybe I if I could, I could jump in on that one, Zakaria, just again, citing yes. the work that we've, we've done in, in Senegal. Um, again, they're using the earth observation data to get a better understanding of deforestation using satellite imagery, uh, better understanding on, on water quality and water depletion rates, et cetera. So these are important um, on, on the environmental side. So, you know, these, these are new data sets that are being developed uh, in the case of Senegal, it was specifically we worked with with the government to to help build some of those data sets internally for them, and they are now using these new data sources to to populate their their data sets. Outstanding. Thank you. Thank you very much for that response. Um, perhaps I'll, I'll give you the floor back again, Dr. Arif, if you have any um, last comment before we wrap up. Uh, perhaps a clarion call. What is the urgent request that you will call for action moving forward from this platform to our audiences in, in Asia and, and, and throughout the globe? Um, is there anything specific that you would like to call upon for the immediate future? Thank you. Uh, Zakaria, we've been beating the drum for a while on having high quality, uh, reliable, responsive data that supports evidence-based decision-making and, and for not just the bank and, and our member countries, but more broadly for decisions to be to be evidence-based. So, you know, the, we, we've been beating this drum for a while and I think we'll continue to beat this. Uh, the, the sounds become a lot louder post-pandemic and now with the food crisis, we're starting to see a lot more calls for quality, high quality data, not just in terms of uh, production and, and you know some of the supply chain movements etc but i think it's an important element and, and this is a call we want to make and, and keep making that there is a need for high quality data to support evidence-based decision making great great insight indeed thank you dario the same question from this platform if you could make it a call or a request for a call for action what would it be so uh, due to my job, I'm always trying to like take insights from people's comments and I have some, something I've learned from, 
from the chat box is that everyone is asking about methodology and ethical AI. So, and I kind of knew it. I know that evaluation professionals are super care a lot about transparency when, when it comes to private companies that are supplying them with services. So um, what I would say is keep caring about methodology and AI, please. And uh, every time you work with a, with a provider, request transparency for sure, especially if it comes to data. And secondly, like I said before, um, if you work in Pakistan, write to me. It is one of our member countries. So yeah, definitely we will be in touch. <laughs> Um, with that, let me wrap up uh, what we heard today from our distinguished panelists, our insights about how uh, uh, data gathered and, and, and analytics will need to flow from a wide range of sources, leverage multiple inputs for informed decision makers and to for a more holistic view of everything from individual needs through system level opportunities. We also need agility. We, which will be needed at every level of the data ecosystem it will be required um, for every regulator, owner of the data management of development organizations, technology providers, and others. Uh, but if we try to operate in silos, we will fail. A deeper collaboration must be embraced, including cross-sectoral innovative approaches to better understand and address development needs. And also we need courage, which is something uh, that is an oppressing need uh, because time is running out to tackle challenges such as climate change. Decisions will need to be made in a shorter term, not in decades. And I leave you with a quote from Peter Drucker, an Australian American author who said, the greatest danger in times of turbulence is not the turbulence, but to act with yesterday's logic. Uh, and those are words of wisdom. I thank our distinguished panelist, Dr. Arif Suleiman, and Mr. Dario Garcia de Viema, thank you to our audiences very much for your courteous attention. Please do complete the post-event survey. We'd love to hear back from you, your feedback, and any other topics that could be addressed by our colleagues at the Asian Development Bank in future events. Salam Po, peace be with you, and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for your attention.